welcome to MIS and we are most honoured to have you here today for this interview session. We would like to ask you some questions for you to share with us your thoughts, your insights and your philosophies and everything that you feel could help us. Uh, we have some questions here. May I start with the first question? Uh, consumers need for diverse products has resulted in product life cycles becoming highly volatile and unpredictable over the years. What concepts in marketing will assist marketing community to accurately predict life cycle movements and response more effectively? The only way you can predict in a highly volatile market with the diversity also of consumer needs wants rising and as you know, society is becoming very individualistic, not even a family oriented. It's like each individual consuming on their own. The only way to manage is experimentation in the field. So you have to constantly experiment and constantly learn from the feedback. That's one mechanism. Second mechanism is with the rise of social media, we have to become more a listening post. So how do you organize a company that is having a continuous listening from the marketplace? Because social media today really broadcasts much better than print media or television ever did. Word gets out, both positive and negative. So watching that and constantly adapting is the only way out. There is no other way one can manage in a highly volatile and highly diverse emerging consumer economy. Prof, may I ask about social media? Yes. Um, this is taking the world by storm, yes. and uh, many organizations embarking on it, uh, have some at the expense of traditional media. Correct. What's your take on this? Uh, there is no question that social media will become a substitute for traditional media. Anything that's peripheral, when it becomes core medium, core medium becomes peripheral. Always the rule. So when we had the print media at one time, when television came, print became almost peripheral. Now social media is coming, which means television would be very specialized, very specific reasons you would use it, like big events, sports events, for example, the football, you know, the World Cup or something like that. Social media will become more universal. So my view is that there's a clear substitution. And if you talk to packaged goods companies, they are already shifting the dollars they want to spend more and more on social media. Yes. That's a very interesting comment you make about television being very specialized in media. Right. Yes. And with um, technology changing so rapidly, yeah. how should organizations manage this? Very interestingly, uh, back to, and I'll come to the technology, what we have seen is interesting. The biggest way to watch the print medium is highly specialized magazines. Used to be one general purpose magazine, That's right. you know, like a look, look or a time magazine, you know, life magazine. Uh, today, you see niche magazines taking over the market, very specialized, right? That's right. So that's clearly what's going to happen. Uh, technology in companies is like breathing air. In marketing, it is much more strategic to understand because the chief marketing officer is now having the budget. 40% of all the IT spending in a company is no longer with the chief information officer, but it is now with chief marketing officer, which means chief marketing officer has to be technically understand to recruit the right set of agencies which are in social media, to understand the power of social media for their own brand, not only brand patronage, but brand alteration. Yes. Consumers are going to take liberty with the brand, yes. and therefore brands two or six that we used to teach, making sure logo remains the same, etc., is no longer possible. Right. So how do you then make sure that your brand is not altered into the way consumer would like to express? Consumers are becoming co-creators now. Yes. Isn't that That's interesting? Right. Yes. And they want to co-produce with you right. your product, by and large, right. your brand, your packaging. It's very fascinating. One additional thing related to that is that I think today what Frito-Lay has done 
American football is a big event, yes. and they are now asking consumers to produce commercials. Mm. It's very much crowdsourcing, yes. and some of those commercials are world class yes. because you know you may have hundred commercials, out of which you can select two. An ad agency cannot make hundred commercials that yes, you can choose right. two. So all of a sudden, it's a very low cost, very imaginative, very creative way of getting consumers to do work for you. So consumers are your best marketers. That's right, yes. With the um, advent of uh, Web 4.0 right now and over the years, it's really taking marketing to a higher level of standards. And uh, it's something certainly many marketers cannot ignore altogether to be successful. Totally. Yes. With that in mind, uh, Prof, can I ask you the next question, which is, uh, what do you see as the biggest change in marketing over the years, and what future make or trends will derail current and predominant marketing concepts? Yes. The marketing concept historically began with product. As you know, Peter Drucker, who I admire yes. enormously, yes. is probably one of the best management thinkers. And he had a very good write-up to say, there are only two real functions in business, innovation and marketing. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Everything else doesn't matter. Yes. Yes. So we became very product-centric. Once you create a new invention, a product, then how do you package, how do you promote, how do you position become very strategic for us? Marketing added value to that product, which may be functionally very good, but now you add emotion. Automobile. Right. You can have a Model T, black, very basic, <laughs> but you can have yes. very exciting automobiles you can make, right? That's so in right. addition yes. to functional performance, you have an emotive bonding, which is what marketing does very well. Engineers add value in the product. Yes. Marketing adds value by associating the product with a celebrity, with a lifestyle, whatever it is. So marketing creates value by association. Right? That's right. I have, we have moved away from that. Marketing used to be promoted on an ingredient in a product. Right. Secret recipe of Coca-Cola yes. or Tiger, yes. you know, beer here, for yes. example. Tiger Bomb, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'm fond of Tiger Bomb, even today. That's right. Yes. Despite all the yes. modern medication, yeah. which is interesting. So it has a secret ingredient, you promote right. the ingredients. Yes. Then we begin to promote, actually, the functional value of the product. What okay. benefit does the consumer have? That's right. The next major evolution in marketing is that does marketing serve a purpose in society right. through consumption? Mm. Consumers are now looking for everything in their life a meaningful consumption. That's right. So what we call, and I'm working on that one, is purpose-driven marketing. How does your product serve a purpose above and beyond just consumption? So what are you doing for the environment in the process? What are you doing, in fact, in terms of uh, improving the, you know, the sustainability in general? You know? All those issues are becoming very relevant. It's called a purpose-driven marketing. Purpose -driven marketing. Uh, Prof, can you share further on this purpose-driven marketing? Yeah. How would Asian companies, for example, embark on this as a first step? Yes. Uh, I think purpose-driven marketing is even more appropriate in the Asian culture because we are not as capitalistic as America is. America is, uh, what I would call, raw capitalism, right? Yes. <laughs> Very, like cowboy, you know, oh, capitalism, yes. essentially. Yes. We still believe in balancing the institutional well-being along with the individual uh, right. pleasure and consumption. Sure. And given that balancing between institution and the individuals, whether the institution is a family, whether the institution is education, government, I think purpose-driven marketing becomes actually the DNA of the Asian culture. Right. Sure. It is in our DNA, except we have not linked it properly mentally, or does not have a planning process, a marketing planning process, where one embeds that purpose, and it will resonate with people much sooner in this country than it would have resonated in America. Um, this is a very interesting concept you have brought up, and uh, can I ask if this applies to very small companies who are small setup? In fact, in our research on this one, 
we have a book called The Firms of Endearment. Originally, it began by having, you know, we fight for market share. Yes. Then we shifted to share of wallet, relationship yes. marketing. Yes. And once that became a CRM, data analytics and all that, I told my colleague that the next major competitive advantage or differential advantage will be share of heart. How do you win the share of heart of your customers? Mm -hmm. But then the book actually became more about the company, not about a product or a brand, or forms of endearment. Mm -hmm. And there we found that companies that are driven by passion and purpose financially outperform companies that are only shareholder driven. So if you are a stakeholder driven, not only customer oriented, but employee oriented, supplier oriented, community oriented, you do better for your shareholders than being strictly shareholder driven, which is absolutely non-intuitive. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned that the best companies are small boutique companies who blend the purpose with marketing. So Patagonia, New Balance, they're all right. family run businesses. That's right. And Singapore and Asia is all family run businesses. So it's much easier because as a family, you know that you have to live in the community. A large corporation in a big city where we live in a gated community, whereas some of the best purpose-driven companies are family-owned and their headquarters are in small towns. Because in small towns, every Sunday church is a great equalizer. Yes. You are no longer the boss, there's a bigger boss than you, yes. which is God, yes. which is interesting. <laughs> and your managers, live next door to you. They're your neighbors. Their children play with your children. So you have this huge informal relationship with your employees that you would not have otherwise in a large metro city by and large. So I do believe that it really begins, this purpose-driven, embedded purpose is much more in the smaller companies. And in fact, they gain popularity because of that and become big businesses. I see. That's very interesting men and in fact insight into purpose-driven marketing companies. Yeah. Can I ask uh, from here, what new age marketing trends will influence future marketing programs and cause a radical shift in the way marketing is applied in the industry? Yes, there are three changes, most of them coming from technology. First one is that today what we have is a demand-driven procurement. If you take a traditional bookseller, the bookseller will order the books, anticipate the demand, right. will keep it in inventory, either on the bookshelf or in a warehouse someplace. Today, Amazon is just the opposite. Yes. They don't even stock anymore. That's right. It begins with order that comes in online. Right. So online marketing is the biggest change in paradigm, yes. reversing the whole flow yes. where demand generates supply chain not manufacturing, That's which is right. totally radically changing. That's right. It is very efficient, so Cisco systems, uh, Dell computers, in the B2B, all orders are now online. That's right. No paperwork. Yes. And therefore, just in time becomes very important yes. now, right? That's right. Fulfillment cycles get shorter and shorter and shorter. Yes. Yes. There is no slack yes. time. So that's so clearly one major impact of technology. Yes. That's right. Second impact of same technology has been the uh, going into the smartphones. smartphones and smartphones getting you into all these applications yes. including social media that's right so facebook twitter etc are yes. making a huge paradigm shift for marketing function more so than any other function which is interesting so i believe that social media as a second component of technology is very powerful yes. the third component of technology is the technology begins to reduce the silos, which are functional silos, or product silos, or geographical silos. So today this technology makes an integrated enterprise. So a chief marketing officer for product A in Singapore, another chief marketing officer for product B for the same company, Hong Kong, a third one based in London, wherever, they are now on a real-time communication. How does that, uh, sorry interrupting, Professor, um, how does that apply <coughs> to the service industry? Service industry, the use of technology is even more necessary. Yes. 
because in service industry you always have a co-production between the consumer and the producer. And in co-production, technology enables much smoother, much easier way of doing things. Without technology, it is much more uh, manual, inefficient, quality assurance. So you think about the hospitals. You think about the hotel, motel, hospitality industry, which are all services. Airlines. Mm -hmm. Today, I do my own reservation. Yes, that's right. I pick up my own, you know, uh, boarding gate ticket, yes, for example, right? right? I mean, everything is online, where consumer right. is co-producer with you, right? That's right? In services, that's very important. That's right. Second reason it's very important is that services are perishable. That means you cannot store the capacity. That's right. And technology enables you to use that capacity you have at that point in time much more than a non-technology-based organization. That's so right. it's much more important. Yes. Can we now turn to China? Sure. And do you think that uh, their current efforts to embrace marketing will make it equal to the U.S. as a marketing leader of its brands? I personally believe that China will not only equal in marketing and branding to America, which is the gold standard, but will surpass. And the reason is that China, like Japan, learned how to produce very price sensitive products, low cost, low price products, and is moving up to luxury. Yes. China is the largest luxury market in the world, it surpassed America. Yes. China is the largest e commerce platform, yes. it surpasses American e commerce yes. platforms. That's right. So I do believe that branding aspects the Chinese will learn from the rest of the world, German brands. American brands, yes. etc., and actually improve on them more yes. and make it even better. Yes. So I think it's a matter of time where we will admire the Chinese brands yes. as we admire the Japanese brands and the Korean brands. Yes. That's right. Today, Samsung, everybody respects, just like That's they do right. with Apple. That's right. uh, today, Toyota is as respected, especially Lexus, the luxury brand, as any luxury brand in the world. I think the Chinese brands will come out the same way, one very value brand and luxury brands. But I personally believe that China will excel in luxury brands, opposite of what we think. And uh, in your opinion, how long do you think if, um, it will take before we see such development and achievements from China? Yes. I think the timing for China's evolution as a marketer of world-class brands is just at the tipping point. Very important thing that happened 20, 30 years ago, 30 years ago roughly, is that China allowed foreign brands to be made in China. That's right. Therefore, they got the technical know-how. They got the raw materials to come to do the labor value add, whether it was in garments, for example, or whether it was in uh, luggage, for example, yes. or whether it was in any product category, such as automobiles. China, therefore, has learned how to make products. Yes. China is now learning what these Western brands were capable of, taking a low-cost manufacturing base out of China and creating a huge value and a high price. So given that nature, Value add can be done through branding and marketing. And my view is that uh, Chinese are such smart businesses, even state enterprises, that they will make sure that they get additional value for the products that they have. So I'll give you some examples. In a B2B environment, business to business, Huawei Technologies is now much more admired by all Western telephone companies as they used to admire Alcatel, Lucent, Ericsson, Sony, Huawei today commands high respect. So they deliver something that is an absolutely superb, exceptional uh, performance yes. for wireless networks. Uh, China is very good in railroad buildings. People don't think so. In industrial markets, Chinese brands are already highly respected. Now come to the consumer side, 
where they are just gaining that momentum to create by putting more effort on the proper marketing side. So higher, which is in appliances, they will become like Electrolux. Yes. They'll become like Whirlpool. And automobile makers the same way. I mean, it's mind-boggling to see how much Chinese are now learning to really invest in branding and make it good for value add much more for the products we make in China. In recent years, um, there were some problems with the image of quality products. Yes. Um, do you think this will hamper uh, their progress and their campaign to build uh, strong brands? No question that any time there is some sort of an adulteration of the product or the quality is not met, especially if it becomes a safety problem, like in the toys, for example, or in the daily products or whatever it is, you know, the market failure takes place, which means capitalistic model may not be the only approach. And therefore, what you have to do is to create a regulatory process, a policy with which you simply say, we have inspection standards, quality standards, you have to manage. Why I'm talking about that one is the rise of Chinese brands would be just like the rise of Japanese brands. So in Japan, which used to be also a cheap goods maker at one yes. time, people used to laugh at made in Japan. Yes. Japanese government said, along with collaboration with the industry, that will create JETRO, J-E-T-R-O, which is the Japan export uh, agency. Right. You cannot sell your products abroad unless it meets minimum quality standards. Yes. And as you know, they hired uh, uh, no, Deming, who was a statistician, to understand what quality is all about, and they invest in quality by mandate. So my view is that by regulation, China will do the same thing, will actually not allow inferior goods to be made in China. Right. Talking about Japan, been reputable for many products, in particular we are most familiar with the electronic products. Um, they have now decentralized many of the operations, including R&D out overseas centers, to be closer to the consumers and to the marketplace. In opinion, do you think that will impact on the reputation of Japanese brands? The answer is yes and no. Sony suffered from that as a Japanese brand when they tried to make products in Malaysia. It's not the assembly that you do in many of the consumer electronics, it is the component to make. If you just assemble and import components from Japan, it's okay. But they started buying locally. And there's no quality assurance in the upscaling supply function, which is the most critical one. So when consumers get a Sony radio or a Sony television, it says made in Malaysia, they always say this cannot be as good a quality as the same television with the same brand name right. made in Japan. And this happened with cameras, for example. Uh, this almost happened with the automobile side. Yes. What nice thing happened, therefore, is that if Japanese companies are serious about distributing their R&D, advanced country to advanced country works very well. So when the Japanese car makers went to America, they didn't have quality problems because America was already having quality assurances. Product safety laws, for example, emission control laws, you know, all this stuff were put by regulation as well as by market process. So I think going to other advanced countries would be less difficult. But going to emerging economies, they have to learn how to manage supply function or create suppliers in emerging markets like China and India or South Africa who are world class. On the same note, uh, in your opinion, do you think that in time to come, um, if China had to do, have to do the same thing, will they achieve the same um, level of success as what the Japanese will have accomplished? I'm absolutely convinced that China will also make the transition, like Japan did, from uh, cheap goods to value to premium. I would say it's a matter of probably no more than two decades when we will have the same admiration of made in China as we now have made in Japan and even made in Korea. Sure. I must tell you, people were skeptical about Samsung, Hyundai automobile, yes, failed right. the first time in the US, 
because yes. they did not put the quality assurance seriously. Yes. But now Honda is a very popular car yes. in America. Yes. That's right. It's a very competitive market. Yes. yes. So, so I think China can easily do it. Yes. It's about 10 to 15 years ago where there were a lot of social stigma about buying Korean products in Singapore. But today, yes. people don't hesitate to buy Korean products. Yes. Um, I have another question for you, Prof. Um, many companies have uh, ignored the balance between making profits and being ethical. Uh, what's your take on this? Uh, it's a no-brainer, as we call it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to be a long-term sustainable company, only way to do business is ethical. Ethical in all four P's of marketing. Yes. Product, your product must be ethically created. Pricing must be ethically, proper transparency. Promotion, which is where we take a lot of liberties, you know, right. has to be the same. And your distribution channels, you must always have ethical distributors and ethical dealers. My view is that it's absolutely a necessary condition. In fact, all companies that have been unethical in their behavior, in any of the four Ps, had a very short life. Mm. Market is unforgiving. You know, and competition is relentless. That's right. And therefore, ethical way is the only way. And I will tell you why I'm passionate, because marketing is a very good, powerful force. Peter Drucker's comment that there are only two real functions of business, innovation and marketing. Right. Society respects and admires innovation. Nations want to invest in innovation, but nobody respects marketing because marketing is only associated with unethical behavior. So we have even a double duty because of the negative image. Anything that goes wrong, it marketers did that. We blame marketing people always, you know? So we have a double reason why we have to go ethical. It's just like made in Japan was a poor image, so they've gone out of their way to prove Japanese products can be world class. Same thing marketers have to say, we can be world class citizens. We can serve the society and make money at the same time. Yes. Or the old saying, doing well by doing good is more important in marketing than it is even in the business decision. That's right. Um, taking further on this point here, uh, many small and medium sized enterprises in Singapore are basically more concerned about short term gain, yes. which is uh, the very uh, sales and profit driven. Uh, putting ethical considerations behind them, although they fully realize that that's important aspects of uh, totality in business. Uh, what advice do you have for this kind of company? Yes. The only way it makes an, a change in a company is to show the huge financial cost of unethical behavior or huge competitive disadvantage. So one always uses those two to convince the senior most management that the cost of unethical behavior, society will punish you for a lot. If market doesn't punish you, then there'll be a regulator who will punish you. There'll be a consumer advocate like Ralph Nader type, you will create. There's a very good saying by Peter Drucker again, who said that if you see the rise of consumerism in a society, it is the shame of market. <laughs> Bad marketers create consumer advocates. Yes. And today with social sure. media, it's very important, even for small enterprises, right. because they all have Facebooks, they all yes. have Twitters now. That's right. It's very affordable. They're all in the cloud. That's right. And a small company can be as damaged yes. as a big corporation today. There is no, um, they're all level playing field, you know? Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're a small yes. or a big. So given that, it's very critical. That's very inspiring advice, actually, to a lot of uh, SMEs, and uh, something which they should seriously consider. Right. Um, can I move on to uh, back to the subject of branding again? Yes. And um, in fact, we are encountering more and more non-US companies in the top 100 most valuable global brands on the 2014 list. And uh, what key lessons can we learn from a mix of non-US to US brands that are entering and exceeding? The least given the fact that more and more companies are investing in branding of products, services, and experiences. I think generally inventors 
and entrepreneurs underestimate the power of marketing and branding. So one has to increase their awareness through either experimentation or through some clinical evidence, by and large. Let me give you an analogy. Turkey, as a nation, decided that great domestic brands, and in prelude to becoming a part of European Union, where the biggest market will be Europeans and therefore French and Germans, they had to show that Turkish brands are world class. So the government actually created a brand assistance agency and they would select so many brands which are world class but only domestic and give them an executive MBA program to train their managers on branding. Hired a consultant, one of the best ones, Jack Trout, who along with Al Ries for the positioning the battle of mind, they asked him to be a consultant, how to implement, action oriented. And today some of the Turkish brands are highly admired in the Western world. Singapore has a similar situation. There are some very good brands, but there is no scale because Singapore is a small town. What has Swiss done, Switzerland has done for their brands and watches? They only think global up front. So Singapore brands, if they think global as their arena to play, not just local, even though 80, 90% of the business may be local, it's a global mindset, suddenly it changes everything. And I'm told, I know I love Tiger brand yes. for balm, you know, for, yes. for headache remedy. Tiger beer, which is now partly owned by Heineken. Yes. That's right. They have told me that Tiger beer will become probably number two or number three brand in the world. Isn't that interesting? Yes. So somebody from abroad sees the value of your brand, and we don't see it, right? But there are quite a few good brands here. Singapore Airlines is a That's world right. brand. Yes. Uh, many of your uh, infrastructure companies, like Changi Airport, is a world brand in the whatever it is. Yes. Uh, even I would say Singapore Seaport Authority is considered a world class, like Rotterdam Seaport is the same way in their sphere of customers. Uh, but some little brands are more interesting. Mm. I don't have experience personally, but somebody told me that you have a but hospitality brand called Banyan Tree. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Much more very boutique. Yes. Managing that, you know, how do I serve the society while I make money, right? Yes. Purpose driven. Yes. So they give livelihood into places right. where they have created. Yes. It is already a very interesting brand yes. and I'm very curious to know more about them now. Yes. Then you have a brand I was told talk uh, bread talk. Bread talk. Yes. Interesting. Yes. I don't yeah. know much about that one. Because I don't eat bread yes. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> which is interesting. But bread talk has a great reputation. That's right. So if you have a good domestic brand reputation, especially from an advanced country, it has actually a global market opportunity. So in the old days we used to say globalization, think global, act global. Then we said, no, think global, act local, local. I have been now creating a whole new paradigm which says, think local, act global. That brand has an enormous value outside of the market in which you survived and succeeded. And that's what Singapore has to learn. Yes. Um, Singapore being a small country and um, basically making a lot of small businesses, um, how long and how much investment in terms of resources, do you think these companies would need to really grow their brand? I think it has to have, surprisingly, in marketing, we have never thought of public-private partnership. Yes. As we do in infrastructure, yes. immediately. I think branding is a public-private partnership, yes. which means government says, I have a vested interest in my native sons and their branding effort, and how can I invest in them and treat branding as an investment proposition for the nation? Because the soft power of a nation comes through its brands. People admire a nation like Japan or Germany because they have world-class products. So it is in the nation's interest to invest in branding, especially for small and medium enterprises. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, 
shared all your uh, very insightful and very revolutionary comments and knowledge shared with us. Um, we'd like to thank uh, for the professor's time today and we hope that the audience and viewers will learn much from this and take this out to practice and grow Singapore brand and all your businesses so that you continue to establish a right, place in the world. Thank you, Professor, for your time. Thank today. you. And thank you. Thank you very much.